John Fuang said that when he first went to stay with John Munn, he was very afraid of a John Munn, because a John Munn was very hard to predict. Say if one of the monks was sick, he'd ask a John Munn for some medicine, and John Munn would give him a stern lecture about taking refuge in medicine. Why aren't you taking refuge in your practice, he would say. Another monk would get sick, and he wouldn't ask for medicine, and John Munn would come and criticize him. Hey, we've got the medicine. Why aren't you using it? And so John Fung said, it sounded like you were going to get criticized no matter what you did. But he said he stayed with a John Munn for a while and began to realize that there was a pattern. If the medicine was there, you would use it. If it wasn't there, you'd make do with what you got. In other words, you'd make do with your practice. That's the kind of thing you learn by watching your teacher and living with the teacher over time. As the Buddha said, there are a lot of things you're going to learn only by spending a lot of time with the teacher and being very observant, and particularly getting a sense of just right in the practice. And the Buddha talks about the middle path or the middle way from the very beginning of his teachings. What's interesting, though, is that even though he presents this as one of the most important principles of his teachings, he doesn't explain it very much. He says the middle way is a way that avoids the extremes of sensual indulgence and self-torture. But there are very few passages in the canon where he talks about what makes the middle way middle. There's another passage where he talks about how the teaching on dependent core arising avoids certain extremes. But these are very subtle extremes, the extremes of existence or non-existence. In other words, the labels that we place in the mind, saying that things exist or don't exist. The labels that would say that the act is one thing, or the person acting is one thing, and the person receiving the results is somebody else, or is the same person. That's another set of extremes. Those are pretty subtle. Even more subtle is that passage where the deva comes to ask the Buddha, so how did you cross the stream? And the Buddha said, I crossed without moving forward and without staying in place. Of course, that totally befuddles the deva. And it's a very subtle an avoidance of extremes, either doing something new or sticking with what you've got. So it's an important principle, but it's one that's not explained. It's one that you have to learn through the practice. Because all too often we're like, well, like the Buddha himself. He started out with a life of extreme sensual indulgence. When he realized that that wasn't going to lead to true happiness, what did he do? He went to the opposite extreme, self-torture. You see this a lot among former addicts who come to the Dharma. They indulged in alcohol, they indulged in drugs, and now they're in, going to indulge in starving themselves, trying to deny all kind of sensual pleasure. Well, neither extreme, as the Buddha pointed out, is going to work. It's easiest to think in extremes, because extremes can be expressed in short sound bites. The middle way requires being very observant, experimenting, and developing a, a sense of what's the just right point in the practice. There's some confusion about this coming from the Thai language. The, the word for just right in Thai is padi, which literally means enough good. And many people will interpret that as good enough, which means you don't have to try to be really good, just good enough, which is not what the Johns are saying when they say. You should do it. Potty. Potty means you have to find the point that's just right. And sometimes just right is outside of the box entirely. Like the Buddha's approach to pleasure and pain. It's not that you try to find a middling point where every pleasure and pain gets neutralized. 
you pursue certain pleasures, the pleasures of jhana, the pleasures that come from mastering virtue and concentration, generosity, so that you can use them. Use the pleasure of concentration to put the mind in the proper mood and put it in the proper frame of mind. Make it stable enough so it can really see things in a balanced way. At the same time, he has you use pain. Pain is a noble truth when you use it as a noble truth. In other words, you use it to understand what's the mind doing around the pain. So instead of pursuing pleasure and pain as goals in and of themselves, he uses them as tools. That's an entirely different kind of approach. So we're not looking for a middling path that's halfway between pleasure and pain. We're looking for a new way to approach them. So you have to keep this in mind all the time as you're practicing. Where is the just right point in what you're doing? And it's sometimes outside the box. If you're the sort of person who's been angry, you might say, well, I need to be really loving and compassionate. And you try being a Pollyanna for a while, and you realize that doesn't work, and you go thrashing back and forth. Feeling that you're you're either too passive or too aggressive. It's not the passivity or the being aggressive that's the issue. It's what your intention is when you're dealing with people. Because sometimes you, you look at the Buddha. In some cases he would totally avoid getting into arguments. In other cases he'd get into argument and he'd be really aggressive. So you have to realize there was something else going on. It's the passivity or the aggressiveness was not the issue. It was his intention. His intention was kind. At the same time, he'd, he'd have a sense that some people would be just a waste of time. They were in the argument simply to win, to make points. They weren't trying to learn anything. Those were the people he'd avoid. Like the Brahmin who came to see him one time and asked, what kind of teaching do you teach? And the Buddha sensed that he was looking for a fight. And the Buddha responded, I teach the sort of doctrine whereby people don't get into useless arguments. That was the end of that. But then there was the case of Satchika, who came to make the Buddha sweat and shake, as he said. And he ended up being the one sweating and shaking, because the Buddha's response to his, his arguments. Satchika was trying to say that, well, everybody knows that you're Form, feeling, perceptions, fabrications, consciousness, these are yourself. And they put a, <coughs> took his, picked his argument apart to the point where he really, loosed, he really lost face in front of all the people that he had, that he, Satchika, had brought along to watch his victory. So the issue is the intention. But then again, you can't take that as a sound by teaching either, because there are certain actions the Buddha said are inherently unskillful and you avoid those. If intention was everything, you could say, well, I have compassion intention in whatever, killing, stealing, having illicit sex, all the way down the line. There are some things where there, are, there is a very clear right and wrong, just like those bear awareness signs in Alaska. There's some areas where there are clear do's and don'ts. For example, as the Buddha pointed out, killing is never skillful. Stealing is never skillful. Illicit sex is never skillful. Lying is never skillful. Device of speech, coarse speech, idle chatter. There are a few cases in those three where the Buddha said, okay, you have to know a sense of moderation. But again, it's not so much that you do a little bit, it's when you see your intention and you're confident that your intention is skillful. 
when you have to speak harshly with somebody, when you have to warn them about someone who's, who could take advantage of them, and when you have to engage in friendly chatter to keep the group going. But those are areas where you have to be very, very careful. In terms of the mind, the Buddha said, inordinate greed, ill will, wrong views. These are never right. So there are some areas where there's a clear right and wrong. But then there are a lot of areas where right is at that point of just right in the middle. That's where you have to watch for your intention, you have to watch for the results. And it's good to have good examples. And this is one of the reasons why we have the monastic sangha. The Buddha didn't write meditation manuals and hand them out. He set up a monastic sangha so there would be people living together and learning the kinds of lessons that you learn from living with someone who's further along in the path, seeing how they handle different situations, the lessons you pick up by osmosis. So there are no easy sound bites if you're trying to find the middle way. It's a body of knowledge that you pick up as you practice, as you live with other people who are practicing and are further along the path. So you learn how to look at incidents and choices from a wide variety of perspectives. In the beginning it's awkward because you find yourself choosing the wrong issues to focus on at a particular time. But over time, if you're really observant and willing to learn and willing to listen, you get a better and better sense of this point of just right. It's like people going to live in the wilds of Alaska. The people who survive are the ones who are not doctrinaire. They're the ones who figure out what works and what doesn't work. And sometimes some modern gear is very useful. Other times you want to stick with the old ways of doing things. And how do you know which is which? There's an experimentation and there's also learning from people who've been there before. Some areas have clear do's and don'ts. Other areas are like that very last item in the bear awareness sign, where the bear has attacked you and is chewing on you. And you have to decide, is this bear chewing on me out of curiosity or out of hunger? If he's chewing out of curiosity, just lie there dead, or playing dead, and the bear will lose interest and go away. If the bear is chewing out of hunger, you've got to fight for all your worth. Now, how are you going to know the bear's intention? You have to be very sensitive. Very alert, very mindful. Right at a point where most people are losing their minds entirely. So this is one of the reasons why we practice, is to put the mind in a position where it can learn these subtle lessons of where it just right is. Be willing to drop some of their doctrinaire ideas that well, it has to be either this or that. The Buddha himself gave good lessons in this. And when he was answering questions, sometimes people would ask him to come down on one side or the other of a question. And in some cases he would, and others he would say, no, this is not a categorical question or a question that deserves a categorical answer. It might deserve an analytical answer, it might deserve to be put aside. In other words, the question is totally framed in the wrong way. So not everything is either or. And it turns out many of the most important issues are the ones where the answer is in, in between the either or the or, and you have to find exactly right where that is. As you practice, it gets more and more subtle. As I said, this distinction between the way the mind slaps the labels of existence and non-existence on things, or the choice that it forces on itself. Are you going to keep doing the same thing or are you going to change and do something else? The right answer is right between the two alternatives. So develop the, to develop the kind of sensitivity you need to figure that out, you have to look for the point of just right in everything you do.
It's only in this way that you gain a sense of just right. I think it's more and more precise. <laughs>